Are I'm you Dennis. Dennis. Yes, I'm Are Dennis. Dennis? Oh, well, I'm John. I'm Dennis, and you're and John. together. <laughs> We've been fostering children. Mm -hmm. And for, dogs. And dogs for nearly 20 years. Nearly 20. John and Dennis have different personalities. John is larger than life. I've got to over. Uh, when you want things done, you go to John. Dennis is the quiet, soulful one. That's always a favourite. Together they make quite a team. I was number one. I was the original. Hey, how are you? I got the ball rolling for them. I didn't make their life easy, and despite this, they decided to take on another one. Hey, let's move. How are you? Good, how are you? I was number two child, and I think by the time I came along, John and Dennis had already figured out that it wasn't easy to be looking after teenage girls. I know. Oh, Miss Pinky Pink, everything has to be pink. Yeah, but it's not anymore, though. Yeah, it's a nice colour. John and I do things differently, but when it comes to children, we always have a united front. We call John the bad cop, and then it's the good cop. Yes. It was a bit like a revolving door. One of us would leave and the other one would come through. Not long after me came Caitlin. Um, no, all good, I can get myself there. Yeah, I'm just finishing work now. Living in John and Dennis was a lot better than before because I could finally be a kid. After everything that I'd been going through and had experienced, it was just so nice to be able to settle into an ordinary family. Well, a typical day in our household, you know, everybody's up at six o'clock. We're not in a hurry. It takes another ten minutes. Always. Liam likes to leave for school at around seven, so he's leaping around looking for shoes and socks, whilst Hayley is still in repose in, in her room. Yeah, mate, it's time. Get up. Good morning, Hayley, get up. Hayley's 14, she's been with us for about two years. She's uh, certainly coming out of a shell, which often happens with kids. Initially, they, when they come, they're shy, they stay in their room a lot. Hayley, chop chop. Over the years, uh, Dennis and I have fostered and mentored probably over a dozen children. <laughs> who is it? Who is? Who, 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 who is Joe? Oh, he's one of my friends. Look, some have stayed a short period of time, maybe a few weeks, a couple of months, but others have stayed uh, five, six years. Very beautiful. John spent a, a lot of his early life surrounded by other people's kids, and um, I think maybe it was just a natural flow on for him to want to foster children. He may not have known it yet, but it was coming. Well, I grew up in New Zealand, a little uh, town called Albury. And it was a little village, a pub, general store and a post office, and a garage. John's mum, Marge, or Auntie Marge, to the village, was one of those lovely women that when you think of her, you think of aprons and cooking, and um, she was always busy doing something for someone. She was a bit like a Pied Piper. Somebody was ill in the country, there was no help after school or anything like that, so mum took over as that person. There was pretty much always somebody else's children um, staying in the house. John was 20 when he decided to leave New Zealand and pursue his career in Australia in design. He had some offers. I think it was around about 30 when he met Dennis. Uh, here's a, uh, some ideas for the 90. Oh yeah, very cute. Dennis and I met through one of the original dating agencies called Yvonne Allen. I don't like this lining in here, it looks cheap and it... We had so many similar interests. 
I had a background in the clothing industry. He did also. In our 30s and 40s, life was pretty good for us. We were both reasonably successful. We had a great social life, eating out, meeting friends, travelling, just generally enjoying life uh, wherever we could. We'd never really thought about having kids. You know, we were having too good a time as, um, as just a couple. But we'd seen an ad in the local newspaper for Bernardo's and uh, it was looking for foster carers. And I thought, well, look, this sounds pretty interesting. You can see these uh, stats here. 17,000 kids. That's pretty good. These are the kids that, that, have, that have been helped. But yeah. Initially, I was not as keen to foster, I guess. I was That's a bit concerned a about whether we really had the ability to deal with young children that might be have some difficulties uh, that, that needed more specialised care. Yeah, you know, you're dealing with somebody else's child. I had some concerns about fostering young boys. Being a same-sex couple, only because of what um, people might think. So my stipulation, they had to be girls. When John and Dennis told us, and it wasn't just I, all, all of us, um, thought they had rocks in their head. What we say, especially with adolescents, yeah. and I do say with the adolescent carers, we want responsible, nurturing adults. John and Dennis applied to be carers for our adolescent foster care, and one of the people that did the assessment came back and she said, oh, Lynn, I don't know about these two. You know, they're so upmarket and <laughs> their house is so salubrious, they have these paintings That's on the wall dangerous. and all these precious, expensive things. And she said, I said to John, John, these could get smashed, you know, and I'll get smashed any minute. What are you going to do? And he said, they're only things. It's OK. <laughs> so we thought that was lovely. It was only a week at most. Bernardo's came back to us and said, oh, we've got this young girl who's in need of an immediate home and it's on a permanent basis until the child is 18. Bernardo's always give you a background briefing of the child. Sarah's past history was, um, was uh, not great. I have some memories of my early years, but none of them are happy. I personally believe I was lucky to walk out alive because my biological mother had something called Munchausen's by proxy. And she liked to break my bones. My biological father abused me. I tried to unsuccessfully tell a number of people um, to what the extent was of what was happening, but no one ever believed me. <laughs> Eventually, there was Jessica, who was a Department of Community Services worker, and I one day wrote a letter, and Jessica saw it, and all of a sudden I was living at a refuge, purely because I don't think I could have lasted any longer. With the level of abuse, I don't think I would have. I lived in around 10 foster homes and refuges before I met John and Dennis. Before I moved in, we had a meeting to see if we, I guess, clicked. And she seemed to be, you know, pretty happy that she was going to move. And um, so finally, we were given the nod, OK, you're on. <laughs> the environment at John and Dennis's place was a complete 180. And it was happy. And there was no yelling, there was no screaming, there was no slamming doors, there was no violence. It was peaceful. They took me shopping and they bought me the first Harry Potter book, The Philosopher's Stone, and I still have that book. 
That gift was special because it was the first thing that Noah could take off me. It was mine. Someone had bought it for me. And yeah, I love that book. John and Dennis enrolled me in an all girls Catholic school. I remember the first day of school because I did not want to be there. Sarah had lost a lot of years, not just months, but years in schooling. And she was absolutely terrified of going to school. The first day I took her to school, she put her uniform on. I think, thought everything was looking really rosy. And I took her in a cab and she got out of that cab and bolted. And I ran the streets of Glee looking for Sarah. And there was a lot of building sites around at the time. And these blokes were on building sites yelling out, hey, you've lost your, lost your daughter, she's gone that way. Didn't feel like I could fit in. I had missed out on way too much. I did truly make their lives misery and it was the running away, it was, you know, the disappearing. After a few months, we were starting to wonder whether we were the right people for Sarah. It did create a lot of tension and it did create a lot of stress on our relationship. Well, the stresses were probably more about how things were dealt with, you know, and, and you know, we're failing here. We're failing as, as parents, we're failing as human beings. We've got to educate this young person. I was thinking maybe we could have done this or that or some other thing and, and then John and I would disagree on what we should have done or didn't do or did do. And so it became a little compli um, probably complicated. So I rang the, the caseworker and I said, oh, listen, you know, I think we've got to get out of this, you know, truly. He just thought, oh, how can I continue to do this? You know, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if I'm helping. And um, of course he was. Like a lot of children in, that come into care, they put you through hoops. There's a trust issue. She had suffered terribly with trust, um, trusting um, her parents. Um, so we weren't expecting her to trust us immediately either. It was extremely hard to accept their warmth, their affection, their, you know, wanting to hug. I was very convinced in my head that they were going to send me back at any stage. I think um, it took a long time before she realised well, we're in here for the long haul. Um, it's probably a good idea that you do trust us. Um, and, and eventually she did. They loved me despite all my flaws, despite all the baggage that I brought with me. They loved me. So you I was 16 oh, when I left John and Dennis's. It's I think at 16 I wanted my freedom. Uh, so I decided to move out. Maybe a month or so after Sarah moved out, we were contacted again and, and asked would we be prepared to take another young person and without hesitation we actually said yes, we would. <laughs> I was born in Sierra Leone, um, West Africa. I don't really know much about my biological family. I know very little of my dad. A little bit more about my mom. My mother is still in Sierra Leone. I was four years old when the war broke out. I remember, you know, having to basically run to the closest swamp uh, in the middle of the night. Um, pretty much just trying to hide out from the rebels, you know, finding you. People took dramatic steps to find shelter. My mother arranged for me to travel with some relatives to a refugee camp in Guinea for about six months. Really wasn't a pleasant situation to be in at a young age.
We arrived in Australia around about 2000, beginning of 2001, on a refugee visa. She was living with family friends, but I guess she was a pretty savvy young kid and she could see uh, what was going on in, in, in the community around her. This is the area that I grew up in. Most of the afternoon after school, I'll come here and spend the afternoon with my mates. Anything to avoid going home. It was just tough seeing these other kids getting raised up differently to how I was. I never felt any comfort, any freedom in the house. It was a very uncomfortable environment for me to live in, where I'll get, you know, beaten up um, and punished for, you know, things that I would do. And I just kind of realised that this really isn't the life that I should be living. And then I decided that I'm going to go to the police. I walked up and the person asked, you know, can I help you? And I said, yes, my name is Musu. Um, you know, nine years old and I'm, I don't want to go back home. <laughs> From then on, I moved into my first foster home with Sandra and Terry Williamson. I was there for a year and life with them was great. It was really peaceful, but it wasn't gonna be forever. It wasn't my long-term placement. When I was told my time there was coming to an end, it was a bit saddening um, because it meant that I'll have to kind of start again. Um, and I've already created such bond with this family. Musa was living in one of the outer suburbs of Sydney and when we first met her we had to drive there to meet her and I rocked up in a black convertible. <laughs> she was quite a gas fire. Is that really for me? Are they like my new carers? It was just like unbelievable. <laughs> like what? Is this, they're playing a joke on me. Musu ran out, jumped in the back, and said, take me for a ride. We drove around the block with this kid sitting in the back thinking that she was a princess. And that was the, the start of our, our relationship. She said, yep, I'm moving in with these guys. John and Dennis had enrolled me to the same school as Sarah. Whenever we've uh, started new schools, it's always a bit, um, a bit nerve-wracking. Oh, that uniform, it was horrible. Can you remember when you just put it on, it just draped over you like a sack? Yes, it was so long. Oh. I always wanted to cut mine. <laughs> Although Sarah had been to school, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time with the community. I'm not sure how we approach all this, meeting other parents, <laughs> And, you know, being, you know, two men, um, you know, how's that going to fit as well? And look, our favourite spot. <laughs> I walked into the playground on the first day of Hiwat, my daughter Hiwat's high school. Hiwat is from Ethiopia. I remember Sarge's class. class. <laughs> this is my class. <laughs> oh, those are good days, I think. John walked me, looks across the field and sees another African child and he goes, look. It's another African child with, you know, a white mum. <laughs> and, and it was really like meeting across a crowded room. You know, we, we glided towards each other and introduced each other and said, oh, hello, how are you? And both looked at these African children and thought, well, I think we're going to be friends. He and I and Dennis, we just forged this incredibly laugh, laughingly gorgeous relationship. <laughs> There she is. There's the birthday girl. She's the most gorgeous woman in the world. My friendship with Hewat started, we had most of our classes together. She would come to my house. Oh, wow. They were wonderful men that I was really happy for Hewat to know. And we had shared many dinners and then came young Liam. Say hello, camera. Photogenic. At... 17, I met a guy and I got pregnant. I very much wanted to, Liam, I very much wanted to be a mother. Hello, little man. Are you on television? 
I was feeling very overwhelmed by the prospect of being such a young mum. And while I had a massive amount of support, I was just tired. So we said, OK, we'll take on the challenge. And we did. Hello. And suddenly he was living with John and Dennis and they knew that I was a maternal and child health nurse. Lindy um, was able to come and to be an amazing help. And her daughter, he what would come over after school. No, what cafe? You always go to that one. No, 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 no. That's one we of used to go for long walks and we did attract quite a lot of stares, I suppose. <laughs> Here's two African children, half a dozen dogs, Anglo-Saxon man and an Anglo-Saxon woman and an Anglo-Saxon baby in, in, in a stroller. And you did really see people thinking, how did that all come together? You know, who, who belongs to who and, and uh, uh, where are they going? Going up, no, there's a cafe up here. After about six months, we realised that Liam was going to be staying with us on a more permanent basis and we loved having him in our life, we loved him dearly. Yeah, look, we had decided after a lot of thought that we would adopt Liam. When John and Dennis decided to adopt Liam, I was angry. I was very angry and hurt. Uh, yeah, I was hurt. I trust him. Gosh, I trust him. But I think there was a mixed bag of feelings. I trust him because they adopted him and they gave him a really good life. I consider John my dad, but my son considers him dad. And it's like, oh my gosh, it makes my brain hurt sometimes. And yeah, it's, I wouldn't call it messy, but it's certainly a new dynamic in terms of family. Something that's special about my family is that we have a lot of nationalities. Liam is happy to talk to anybody about his family and the fact that he has two dads and multiple sisters, even to the extent where he recently was interviewed on a TV program. Um, I have heaps of sisters. I can't even count. I can't think of the top of the, my head because it's too many. We've always thought that it's very important for <laughs> Liam to know his background, as it is any child that is adopted. Um, so uh, once he started asking questions, um, I drew a family tree. We've got some very close friends. We've got Donna Peter. We've got uh, Lindy and Hewat. There's a good one of your mum. You're forgetting Ariana. Oh, uh, I am forgetting Ariana. Yeah, she liked to come over for dinner and we yes. mentored her. Yeah. Liam's concept of family is wonderful. He embraces everybody that has come into our life. He sees that as family. The other person that we're forgetting here is... Caitlin. Caitlin. She moved in after... Moose uh, moved, moved out, that's right. I came to live with John and Dennis when I was 13. I was always struggling in my family situations. I moved around a lot and it was very hard for me to settle in a family environment. To be a part of the sort of family that John and Dennis have was great. The other girls, we were all very close. We all kind of treat each other like we are sisters in a way. We may not be blood, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all there for each other, we all support each other and we've all built a relationship that's quite strong. All right, come on, everybody out. Sarah has a significant birthday, so we've decided to get all the family together to celebrate. We're so diverse. We've got African, Persian, Vietnamese. We've come from around the globe into this one household, a village of all these nations coming together. It's awesome. And then the reward for us is to see them come back. So. The door is always open and they're always, they're, they're always coming back. I think that all the kids that we've looked after, they've survived. They're survivors. <laughs> they've done the work. We've just been there to guide them. And they've popped out the other end pretty decent human beings. Are they the right shape? Are they, are they perfect? I don't know. I just... I have a really great job and I think my life has changed dramatically to what I was when I was 12. 
I it literally turned into badass. I'm sure. looking all these tricks. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all doing pretty well, like Ariana, she's travelling, living on her own as well. Yeah. Caitlin, she's studying at TAFE and working at the same time. I work for Telstra, you know, I'm a case manager there and actually recently just got named um, Employee of the Month, which was really good. Hayley, she's still at home with the boys and doing great at school, she gets really great results. Why are you actually spinning? Because I don't want to wet salad. Moving in with John and Dennis is pretty much like winning a car, hitting the jackpot. It's like all of those things rolled into one. You don't get foster carers like John and Dennis. Oh, it's so cute! <laughs> We've discussed how long we're going to keep fostering and so we really haven't put a time limit to it. I think while ever we're able to, while ever we can offer a child something and, and still, um, still do it well and meaningfully, then we'll, we'll keep doing it. <laughs> it has been a remarkable 20 or so years and I look back and think, well, what would I have been doing in those 20 years? I can't imagine, I really can't imagine my life 20 years ago without having these children. And look, this is not the end, you know. Um, I think I'd like them all to be the pallbearers at my funeral. The more the merrier. We are...